and to continue out our worship day unto him. It is our prayer that the things that we do and say uh, will be pleasing and acceptable in his sight and edifying and encouraging to all those who are here. I want to just quickly just uh, uh, share something. Um, uh, if you were here this morning, you saw, yes, that we did have two uh, young children that came forth uh, to put on Christ in baptism. It is always a concern that when you're baptizing someone that they understand what it is they are doing. Uh, it's like what people fail to realize when they go into a relationship, when they go into a, a covenant relationship that is binding and, and you don't want to go into something and attach yourself to something and you're not real sure what it is or not only that, what even moves you or causes you to want to do that. Now, I would like to think, and I just wanted to share this with you, that in the message this morning, uh, um, I had heard some folks say that the, the two young folk hadn't had any um, uh, Bible study. In other words, no um, uh, OBS teaching and that sort of thing. Well, if you, if you understand what the gospel is and how it works, uh, first of all, when uh, the Bible teaches us that when you hear, uh, I think it's in, twice in the book of Hebrews, where the Bible says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Well, what is it you're hearing? If you hear something that pricks your heart, you don't need to know the whole Bible. Matter of fact, you don't need to know a whole lot of Bible. But if something pricks your heart toward God, that's when you make your move. And then God will be with you if you are sincere from that point on. So here's what I think. Here's what I hope and pray that caused them to come forth. Remember, we started out talking about birth. And then when we got to the part of the young folk, this is what we shared with them. We said that uh, the Bible says, God says, I love them that love me. Now, we know that, you know, uh, there are some of our children that probably love God more than their parents do because they be wanting to come to church and the parents don't. <laughs> yes. Amen. We're aware of that. It says, I love them that love me and those who seek me early shall find me. Now, maybe that pricked the young folks heart. They love God. They heard in his word because we're talking about the promises of God. And we have too many folk that's been in the church forever that really don't seem like they believe the promises of God. The promises of God don't have to go like this. I promise you, blah, blah, blah. Amen. God don't have to do that. We do that. But we got to understand if God says something, that is standard. That is stable. That is established. God says what I say I will do. My word will not return unto me, void, but it will do what I send it out to do. And we know the scripture tells us about how much God loves children. Why? Because those children will grow up to be good servants of the Lord as they go through their lives. But our parents sometimes have too much worldliness still going on in them that they put more of the worldliness in their children while they're young because they want them to grow up to be whatever. You know, professional athletes or or movie stars or whatever, and you see how that business is going. And so that's the carnal thinking. God is trying to get us to understand that since people leave this world at all ages, young and old, if you care about your soul, you need to learn to make the right decisions that's going to get you where God is. And that has to do with our spiritual lives, if you will. So I, I, I just uh, I thought about that afterwards. Uh, uh, after we left this morning, uh, we also shared the verse with him that's in the Bible. Train up a child in the way in which he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. So um, uh, th this morning, we was just trying to share with you uh, some of the, just a few, when even that many, because I didn't have enough time, but promises that we ought to be aware of and already experiencing in the physical realm of our lives. But the promises of God for our spiritual lives is so much more important. And it is the part that we tend to, I guess, overlook or not fully understand. Um, 
I, I want to just go ahead and pick up right there because I don't want to, I want to make sure I get up, we get all of this in. I need you to have your Bibles ready tonight. Uh, we will be, um, I have about at least five of these that I want to make sure you read from, or you hear, read, or read in your Bible as we go through them. Uh, the spiritual realm, uh, the majority of the better promises that the Bible talks about in Hebrews chapter 8 and the verses number 6. Uh, that's where we read where we are told about the better promises. You know, uh, you and I, uh, unlike Israel, the Israelites and uh, um, uh, the Old Testament folk, the, the Bible says that our covenant, our um, blessings, promises are built on better promises. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6, the Bible says, but now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, talking about Christ, which has established, which was established upon better promises. So the promises that God made to Israel, God promised them the land of Canaan. He's telling us that our promises are better than a land on this earth called Canaan. Our promises are in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly places with him. And just like in order for Israel to get that promised land of Canaan, they had to be obedient. We have to be obedient for the promise that Christ has given us, which is heaven. You know the saying, heaven is a prepared place for everybody. <laughs> somebody told that lie to somebody. But your Bible will tell you that heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now, if you don't believe that, then that means nothing to you. But the worst thing for a Christian to do is say they believe it, but not to the point to where they're willing to actually do it and follow through with the things that God says. And oh, by the way, in the end, they will not receive that promise because they didn't have enough faith or probably faith and obedient will to do what God says needs to be done. God has thought of everything and has provided for every phase of our spiritual life. These better promises are related to our life in Christ and how we live for Christ. That's what those promises are based on. We have an inexhaustible treasury, if you will, of promises to draw from. As troubled and as burdened as we are, in other words, all the stuff that we have going on in our lives, God has an app for that. Well, that was for the young folk. Uh, they didn't even get it, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we must learn to come to God for our supplies. There are people trying to serve God without asking or trying to find out how God wants to be served. Amen. So therefore, they go ahead and do what they like, what they feel is okay, or what somebody else done told them is okay, and that's how we end up with all these different denominations, all these different folk who are being led astray, not, you just can't blame the false preacher and the false teacher for that. God is going to hold them accountable. But the folk that are following them is going to be held accountable also. Why? Because they can check for themselves. We have examples in scripture of how even in the early church, the Bereans, I think they were called, how that daily they searched the things that somebody told them to make sure that it was right. And we try to get y'all to do the same thing. And that's why sometimes when I hear some questions or some statements that some of our our, our brothers and sisters make it kind of give me chills. It's like, wow, you, you, you didn't know that? As much as we've taught this, as much as we've talked about this, and yet you're still 
that tells me that there's been a disconnect somewhere. Not necessarily in the teaching, but probably in them allowing the teaching to guide their lives. God's word is too simple for anybody to be lost who don't want to be lost. But when we come to God, we should come to him with reverence, with humility, with the simplicity of heart. And you come to God by or in the name of his son. He says clearly, no one can get to the father but by me. So guess what? You even have some folk who they pray to Jesus. <laughs> what, did, what did he tell you? He said, when you pray, say, our father. Amen. Letting you know that you are my brother and just like he's my father, now he's your father. You say, our father. You don't pray to Jesus. You pray to the father by the authority of Jesus. <coughs> So again, what's happening with that? Why would, it, why would a person <coughs> continue to do something when you've shown them their error and they continue to do it? What's going on? <clears throat> Those of you who are still praying for the kingdom to come, you don't realize <laughs> your problem? Uh, when the Lord comes, he's not coming. And I know you've heard people say this, <laughs> but you don't read this in your Bible. He's not coming to set up a kingdom. We're told in the book of Daniel that that was going to be done before Christ, uh, after Christ came. That God, in the days of those kings, when the Roman Empire was ruling the world, that's when Christ, that's when God, the Bible says, set up a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. And brothers and sisters, that's the kingdom you are in right now. So if you're praying for the kingdom to come, you know you must be missing something. Uh, either you don't recognize you're in the kingdom, and oh, by the way, hopefully when the light comes on and you do recognize you in the kingdom... I hope you also recognize you got some making up to do. <laughs> you've been in the kingdom all this time and you've not been doing kingdom things. You've not been doing kingdom work. We already indebted to the Lord enough. I don't think you want to get behind in your debt. <laughs> we can never repay the debt that he's taken on our behalf in the first place. So at least we can do is love him enough to trust him and obey him. But again, that's only for those who have a desire to be saved. If you're not there yet, uh, then none of this will do you much good anyhow. But we come to God in the name of Jesus Christ to prove that God will withhold no good thing from us. The Bible tells us that. God, the only reason God withhold things from us is because of our iniquity, because of our sins. He wants to bless us. God didn't create all this world, uh, this whole world and give man dominion over so man can suffer from it. But because of man's disobedience, because of man's behavior, that's what causes his suffering. He just had to tell Adam when Adam decided to listen to Eve rather than listen to him. He says, okay, so from now on, you got to get out the garden. You got to go. From now on, by the sweat of your brow is how you will make a living, how you will eat. Wow. So Adam lost the blessings of paradise because of his disobedience. And then from that point on... <laughs> We're involved in that too. But the Bible is trying to show us God's word that we don't have to stay in that condition. You're in the world, but not of the world. That don't make sense to folk in the world, to the carnal minded. That don't make sense. In their minds, if you're in the world, then you are of the world. You're a part of the world. Well, God says to his children, 
You are in the world, but now that you have given your life to me, you are no longer of the world. The word of there means belong to. You don't belong to the world anymore. You belong to me. Though you're in the world, you have to put up with worldly things, but you don't have to give yourself over to it, especially if it goes against my word. It don't get no simpler than that, folks. And you, you, you can't really say that, well, if you say you're a Christian, if you say you study your Bible, I don't see how you can say you can't understand what the Bible teaches. So we're going to see if we can expose a few of the things that causes us problems uh, from our physical man to our spiritual man. We talked about the physical this morning. We're dealing with the spiritual tonight. Listen to these now. Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 4 verse 28, now brethren, as Isaac was, so let me pause there with you. What he's talking about, Isaac was the promised child to Abraham. God promised Abraham a son. Abraham believed God, but yet Abraham listened to his wife, Sarah. Sarah didn't have the faith that Abraham had. So Sarah tells Abraham, take my bride, uh, take my servant and have a child with her so that you can have a son. That is not a child blessed by God. That was man's doing. God is, was trying to also show Abraham that though you are almost 100 years old, you can still bear children if you're with me. With God, all things are possible. And when we come around and try to diminish that and we won't believe that and accept that, all we're doing is putting up roadblocks for our own spiritual understanding and blessings. And people do that all the time. And I like to think in many cases, maybe not even realizing it. So Paul, Paul says here, now, brethren, Paul is talking to Christians now, just as Isaac was promised, the promised child of Abraham, he says, we are the children of promise. Talking about Christians now. It says that we are, of the, uh, we are fellow heirs, we are of the same body, and partakers of God's promise in Christ by the gospel. Ephesians chapter 3 Verse number six. It is the gospel. Nobody can, can obey Christ without the gospel. <laughs> and so, when people are asking for other gospels, they don't want to hear the true gospel. They want to hear prosperity gospel and how wonderful God is and all that. God's going to always be wonderful. He's going to always be all of that. But that don't mean we will be. If we want to be like God and with God, then we have to learn to obey God. You don't have to go to college to get that, to know that. You can pick up a Bible from anywhere and read it. But if you believe that the, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, you can get enough information to help you make the right decisions in life as it pertains to your spirit man. So then watch this. Y'all ready? Get your Bibles and your apps ready. We're going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me give you this so you know what we're going to be looking for as we go through these verses. As we proceed, we will see that all of the glorious promises gathered around our life here on earth have all, all the necessary things for, listen to this carefully, for the refinement of our nature. <laughs> we have to change our nature, right? But we can't do it. God's word is what does that. For the refinement of our nature, for the enlightenment of our understanding, for the regulation <laughs> of our will. In other words, we're supposed to be doing God's will and not ours. God's word would help you regulate that and the purification of our affections. 
Promises of pardon, of mercy, acceptance with God, the unceasing ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to guide us, to comfort us, to teach us. And it's a sad thing that a lot of church folk, <laughs> let me say church Christ folk, don't seem like they really understand the Holy Spirit. Because they've listened to and saw too much of the foolishness that goes on in, in denominations that they blame on the Holy Spirit. You know, they got the Spirit. <laughs> and that's what causes them to shout and jump flip benches and run around the building and, and fall out. I mean, uh, that don't sound like the Holy Spirit to me. When I read my Bible, that sounds like the demon. The demon-possessed folk was doing that kind of stuff. Running off cliffs and running in the, in the walls and biting themselves. And the, the Holy Spirit don't make you do foolish things, folk. The Holy, you got to understand, the Holy Spirit is intelligent. The Holy Spirit is God, Spirit. He's not going to have you doing silly stuff like that. God works with our mind, which Bible refers to as our hearts. In no way in scripture can you read where the Holy Spirit fell on somebody and they fainted, <laughs> shouted, passed out. You don't read that. So if somebody is teaching you something that you can't find in scripture, the question becomes, why do you follow it? Why do you obey? Why do you even listen to that? That ought, that ought to be your red flag right there to let you know something's wrong. But uh, as we go to 1 Corinthians, uh, well, let me finish this. Uh, not only the unceasing ministry of the Holy Spirit and of angels. Uh, there are folk in the church, probably some of y'all right here tonight, still don't even understand how angels play a part in our lives. <laughs> you, you, you know, man is good at I don't know what, fooling us, feeding us. Uh, uh, you, you got TV shows, Touched by an Angel, uh, all these other things where they talk about angels. Uh, that's not Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and if that's what you're thinking, yet the Bible tells us that we all have angels. Yes, what is an angel, church? An angel is nothing but a servant of God, just like you and I, only the angel is spirit. And you and I are spirits in the flesh. <laughs> so when we don't allow God's spirit to guide us, you have to understand you are listening to Satan's spirit. Satan is spirit too. Remember, Satan was an angel in heaven. <laughs> got kicked out. It's almost like some of y'all taking advice from somebody who can't keep a house, can't pay their rent, and they trying to tell you how to pay yours. You gonna listen to them? Satan got kicked out of heaven. He know he can't go there. Jesus has never gotten kicked out. He left on his own and went back, and now he's trying to tell you, I will come back for you if you will obey me. And yet we listen to Satan more than we do the Lord. Why? Because we fail to make the spiritual connection that we need to make to put ourselves in the position to be where and what God wants us to be. Uh, not only will we have that, but we'll also have a more conscious fellowship with God and Jesus Christ. And just waiting, those promises that they have made is just waiting for us to claim them and experience them. God wants us, <laughs> if, if anybody don't believe that God, God don't want you to be happy while you're here, that's the devil's lie. God wants you to be happy, but not at your soul's expense. <laughs> we go after the things that we feel makes us happy. And the Bible says, yeah, there's a ways that seem right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's some things that we spend all of our life going after and not realizing it's leading us straight to death. When I say straight to death, I'm not just talking about whether you die by a gun, a Mack truck, or a knife. I'm talking about death being that separation from God. That's what he's talking about. 
things that are right, that seems right in a man's eyes, or the end thereof are the ways of death. He's talking about it's going to separate you from him. That's that second death that everybody is going to have to experience. Just like everybody's going to have to experience the first death. The first death is the dying out of this physical body. That's when you die and you get put in the ground or burn up or whatever you want them to do with you. But there's a second death. Just like there's a second coming, there's a second death. When Christ comes the second time, those that he take back with him, they will be the ones that would have avoided that second death. Those that don't go back with him, they are now experiencing the second death, which is nothing more than the separation from God for an eternity. I know you read that in your Bible. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I know that if you read your Bible, you can see that in your Bible. But why does it not click? <laughs> why does it not register? Why does it not motivate us to do more spiritually than we are doing when it comes to doing things for the Lord? There is a need for every promise that God has made. And there's a promise for every need that we have. So we cheat ourselves when we don't listen. We don't listen to God. There's so many that are still just going through the motions, which is a sad thing. Aimlessly seeking God, having very little or unstable faith, not even sure or assured of their standing with God. And that's not what God wants for his people. God don't want you to be in doubt. God don't want you to be not sure that you're his. He wants you to have that confidence because he knows that if you have that confidence, your chances of messing up or leaving him is going to be a lot slimmer. But again, we tend to not want what God wants. Why? Because most of the time, if you don't know what God wants, how you, how you going to want what God wants? Let's roll. First Corinthians chapter two. Brother Ellis is going to be reading that for me. Y'all listen carefully. Uh, I need you to do it fast and crisp. First Corinthians chapter two, starting at verse 12 through verse number 16. This is in reference to refining our nature. Watch what the Bible says now. Read. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, remember what we, uh, well, I want to make sure you stay on point this morning. Now, this is talking to Christians. This is not talking to everybody. So look at what he's telling us. <laughs> we didn't receive the spirit of this world. We received the spirit of God. So if we have the spirit of God, it should be helping us to fight against the spirit of the world. But if you like the spirit of the world. If you like the worldly things, you're not going to fight. <laughs> you, you, you're kind of like one of them lazy uh, hound dogs or bulldogs that people buy. It's supposed to be a guard dog. And all you got to do is take a piece of the meat to the door. You knock on the door, throw the meat on the floor. He'll let you come right on in. He's supposed to be barking, scaring you off, but you done fed him. So guess what? You got a friend. <laughs> That's what Satan does to a lot of God's children. He'll go ahead and give you what you want so that you won't hold fast to what God says you need to hold fast to. Read. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Not the things that man teaches. Everybody hear that? But what the Holy Ghost teaches. Now, let's do this because this is important. When you're in high school, college, university, whatever you want to call it, all that's man's teaching. All that's good wisdom. All that's good knowledge. But it can't help you get to heaven. It can help you have a nice job here. Right? But that's about as far as it's going to go. That's man's teaching. He's trying to tell you and I that the things that God is about is not the things that man teaches, but that the, what the Holy Spirit teaches, what God's word teaches. And that's what we tend to ignore or 
reject more often. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about our nature. So how is my nature going to change from being carnal to understand it more from a spiritual perspective? It has to be with the things that God teaches and not just what man teaches. Read. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That's what I needed you to hear. The natural man, remember we're talking about refining our nature now. The natural man cannot receive the things of God. And yet that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> we, 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 we will tell folk how smart we are in a minute. When God says it's foolish. God didn't already said in his word, he will make the wisdom of the wise, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. Why? Because man cannot get to where God is without God. <laughs> so we're talking about changing our nature. What's going to change our nature? What's going to refine our nature? God's word is where it starts. Read. What verse are you on? Verse 14. Come on, I got 10 minutes. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. for they are foolishness unto him. See? Neither Read. can he know them because Neither they can are, he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Because they are spiritually discerned. When you don't allow God's Spirit to help you discern God's Word, yeah, some folk have even said that the Bible is foolishness. Well, okay. There's a reason for that mentality. You're not listening to God, you're listening to man. Read. But he that judges spiritual, uh, spiritual judges all things. Uh -huh. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Read. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. Where is the mind of Christ here tonight? Y'all look at me like that. <laughs> you holding it in your hand. We have it, <laughs> but we won't use it. And we think we're all right. <laughs> Satan is shrewd. We also want to look real quickly at the, um, the uh, enlightenment of our understanding. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. You get that. I'm going to go ahead and get Proverbs because we got to move fast. Uh, uh, for those of you who are pretty fast, we go into Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5 through 7, after he reads Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 6. Read. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Verse 5. And we have tasted the good word of the Lord God and the powers of the world to come. If they should fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh mm -hmm. and put him to an open shame. Basically, you know what that's saying? Is every time you go out and sin and the world sees it and you call yourself a Christian, you're crucifying Christ all over again and you're putting, it says, him to shame. Well, it's not really him. It's you that's being put to shame. What you're saying is uh, the, Christ's death on the cross don't mean that much to you. So therefore, you continue to do what you want to do when he died so that you can understand that the things that you want to do are the things that are going to cause you to be lost. He died to help give you a way to where you can now learn what you can do to be saved. And notice it says, I think it says something about it is impossible that if you was once enlightened, what do you think enlightenment mean? <laughs> you know, when you learn something that you didn't know before, that's enlightenment. As you read God's word, that's your enlightenment. But do you understand what you are reading? We ask that question all the time. And, and we ask the question so that you can ask questions if you don't understand. But pride won't let us do that. And then sometimes when we do ask questions, they seem so foolish that it's like, well, okay. <laughs> Forgive those who mistreat you. For if you don't forgive those who mistreat you, God won't forgive you. What kind of explanation do, do you need? Is that not plain, understandable? But it doesn't seem to move some folk. <laughs> you still got folk carrying grudges and they mad at folk who done something 30 years ago. They can't let it go. 
not realizing that if you die in that state, you're in sin, you want God to forgive you, but for 30 years you haven't forgiven All I want you to know is you're deceiving yourself. And not only are you deceiving yourself, you're condemning your own self. Because that is too clear for you to not understand. Now all you have to do is make the decision as to whether you're going to do it or not. And that's what we do every day of our lives. We make decisions. But are they decisions made toward God or are they decisions made toward ourselves? We know. Proverbs chapter 4. Y'all, some of you should already be there. Verse 5 through 7. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, Brother Elder, if you would go on ahead and wait for me at uh, Colossians. No, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 18. And then Colossians 3 and verse number 2. Yes. Uh, here, here in Proverbs, this is again talking about the understanding part. This is what, this is what your Bible tells us about understanding. Now watch what it says. It says in verse number uh, verse number four, verse number five. The Bible says, get wisdom. Is that in your Bible? Then it says, get understanding, right? It says, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, right? In other words, the words of God is something that you should never draw back from. You should try to get as much of God's word in you as you can. That's what helps you with your wisdom of God. And notice what he says in verse number six. He says, forsake her not that her, he's talking about wisdom, forsake her not and she shall preserve you, love her and she shall keep you. Talking about godly wisdom. Now, here you go. Verse seven, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all thy getting, get understanding. So that's the question on the floor tonight. <laughs> Are we having problems with our understanding of scripture? Are we even trying to understand it from God's perspective, not from our own little carnal mind? We need the spirit of God to help us to understand the things of God. He just read that to you in the Corinthian letter. Man cannot receive those things on his own because they are spiritually discerned. And without the Holy Spirit of God, Maybe you have heard this before, and if you haven't read it, I think if you went to Jeremiah, I want to say 1023, it's over there in Jeremiah, I think that's 1023, where the Bible says, Oh Lord, I know that it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. But man will come along, you know, think he's educated and know everything, and man figures that I can direct my steps. Yeah, you're right, right in the hell. You know, when, when the Lord is talking to us, he's not talking to us about the, 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 the worldly results of things. He's talking to us about the behaviors and the actions and the things that we do. Is it going to lead us to him or is it going to lead us away from him? That's all God is concerned about. And if he is telling you the things that's going to lead you to him and you refuse it, then you made your choice. If he's telling you the things that lead you away from him and you choose to do that, you've made your choice. God is not going to cry. But guess what the Bible says? Where you end up, the Bible says there's going to be weeping, that's crying. And gnashing of teeth, that's pain. That ought to let you know what he's talking about. None of that will be in heaven. It's going to be in the place that you choose to dwell in because of your disobedience to the word of God. Wisdom, understanding. The next thing we are talking about is the regulation of our will. What does that mean? Regulation of our will. No, well, you know what regulate mean, right? Uh, it means that it's just not an all out thing. You regulate something. That means you get to control how much or how less you take in, how much or how less you know, how much or how, how less you do. So in God's word, uh, there's uh, quite a few places that talks about the will of God. Here in the Thessalonian letter, in, I think Thessalonians chapter 5, is it? Five, verse, 18, verse 18, the Bible says what? In everything, give thanks. Now, now, and, and now okay, now watch this. What does everything mean? Everything. <laughs> 
the good and the bad. In everything, do what? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ. How many Jesus. of you think God, if you lost your job, if you went to work tomorrow, you find out you got a pink slip in your box. Can you thank God for that? Oh, that wasn't the right question. I said, can you? Will you thank God for that? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> because you're so carnal minded, you know, you, you, there go my paycheck, there go my rent, there go my whatever. Not realizing that maybe, maybe that's what God wants for you. Maybe God is trying to get you out of that place. He's got a better place for you. Uh -huh. But because you're so carnal minded, you can't see God working in your life. So guess what you do? You rebel. Then you start doing, trying to do your own thing, just like Miss Sarah did. And you just make a bigger mess than what it is. A child of God should not be living like that today. Not one who's re who really do believe, understand, and trust God. You lose your job. I mean, now, <laughs> I ain't going to waste a whole lot of time on that because if you got that pink slip because you don't go to work like you're supposed to, you're supposed to lose that job. God ain't got nothing to do with that. Hello? <laughs> See, if you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do and you lose your job, yeah, you, you, you ought to be able to know that what God must be behind us. Just like with Job. Job did nothing wrong. God was behind everything Job went through because God was using Job to prove a point to Satan. You and I have to believe that and understand that even though you may be doing everything right, some bad things are going to happen in your life. But how do you deal with it? Look at how Job dealt with it. He didn't cuss and fuss and quit. And because of that, the Bible says he was blessed twice as much as he was in the beginning. We don't let God bless us because we don't have the spiritual mindset that we should have. And the Bible shows it. <laughs> These are not Brother Gay's words. That's why I want you to hear it in Scripture and also coming from somebody else. Where am I? Colossians chapter 3 verse 2. Set your affection we talk about the purification of our affection. Purification of our affection. Uh, so when you talk about the word affection, we know that it has a different meanings, right? But when you we understand when you, talk, when you read in the Bible and it's talking about affection, it is talking about those things that God wants us to be in love with and to like and to want and to do. So scripture says that we are to do what? Set your affections on where? things above. Okay, right there. And we're, think, talking, we're, talking, we're talking about the spiritual thing tonight. What's above? God, who is spirit. Heaven, which is the uh, place where spirits who obey God will go. So again, how often do we who are spirits in this physical body think about the place that we're trying to go? He tells us here, set your affections. When he says set your affections, he's telling you, you have the control to do that. You set your affections on things above and watch this. And not on things. Not on the things of on the earth. earth. Mm. Well, if that's all you've been about is worldly things all your life, how are you going to make that transition? Worldliness is all you know. You think that you're where you are and got what you got because of what you've done in the world. And you might be right. But what's your standing with God? With what you got? In what you're doing. So he says set your affections on things above. And not on the things of this earth. Now right here. Uh, go on down to five. Because uh, this is important. Then I may have to. Uh, go, go on down to five. For you are dead. And your life is hid with For Christ dead, with God. Your life is hid in Christ with God. Read. When Christ, who is our life, shall when, appear. No, uh, here's what I want you to hear. We're talking about the spiritual. Now the Bible says, when Christ, who, who is, is our, life, our life, shall appear, appears, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We shall also appear with him, where? In glory. In glory. Mortify, therefore, hold your... Hold on, hold on. Is that what you want? Now, what I was, what I was trying to do th this morning... Just not enough time in the day. What I was trying to get you to see this morning is this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this off with 1 John chapter, chapter 2, I think it is, following, following Colossians chapter 3. 
um, uh, read Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 4 and 5 again. And I'm going to finish it off with 1 John. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil cuspience, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, that, that's good. The part I wanted, you, wanted them to hear was when Christ comes back, we shall appear, did it say with him? You shall appear then, shall ye also appear with him in glory. Shall we also appear with him in glory? Did y is that in your Bible? Now, here's what I was trying to take you to this morning, uh, trying to get you to understand about, and, and I don't know, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I think I had you, I was trying to take you to the part where after Christ died on the cross, we know that he was in a physical body. Amen. Hello. And we know that he was how old? Th about 33 years old. So when he died, right, uh, after he was resurrected again, even then we know he had a different body than he had before he died because his own disciples didn't know him right off the bat. Married those women when they first saw him, they didn't know him. He had to tell them who he was. And he went on to tell them, if you recall, don't touch me, for I have not yet rescinded back into my father. So he's trying to show us. Now remember, uh, Christ, before he came, he was spirit with the father in heaven. He came, he put on flesh. We can see flesh, say amen, amen. but you can't see spirit. Right. So look at what he's promised us if we obey him. He says when the Lord comes back, we're going to be able to see him. But what do you what do you think you're going to see? Well, if he was about 33 years of age in the body that he put in the body that he was in, when the Bible says when those uh, 12, 11 men or 12 men uh, uh, said the angel said to them, why do you stand here gazing as Christ was being taken up on the cloud? The Bible says he's going to come back in the same manner on a cloud. You will see him. You can't see spirit, but you will see him. Why? Because he's going to be in a body. And the, that body is going to be the glorified body that he took on. Which is why you and I, when he comes back, we have to have a body trans. <laughs> and in that body me being 71 years old in this broken down body thank God he ain't going to give me a 71 year old body then I just have to believe that when Christ comes back since I'm going to be like him and I'm going to see him as he is he was young he was 33 years old when he left here he was in a glorified 33 year old body and I believe when he comes back all of those that he take back with him, probably about 33. <laughs> but remember, time and years don't count in heaven. So what I'm trying to show you is he did not age. How can he age? He was 33 when he left the earth. He went back to be with the father. He didn't put on another year or another. Remember, the Bible says one day there is like a thousand years. And when he comes back to get us, and remember, at that point, time shall be no more. So, so, so we have so much that we ought to be thankful for, that we ought to be cognizant of. That in itself ought to motivate us to do right. But it don't. So here's your verse. Here's what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. The Bible says that don't mean it's you. I'll forever say that as long as I'm preaching. Because that's going to fit somebody. Just because you are here don't necessarily mean you are doing what God says. He's showing you how God feels about us. He's showing you what God wants for us. We have to want what God wants. So, Paul, so, so the writer John here says, we are the sons of God and does not yet, 
it does not yet appear what we shall be. We don't know what we shall be. But watch what it says. But we know. Do you? <laughs> the Bible says we know. We know what? We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, and for we will see him as he is. And he won't be a spirit when he comes back. He will be a spirit in a glorified body that can be seen. And you and I will be given a glorified body that can be in heaven with God throughout all eternity. And those other folk, they're going to have a, <laughs> I don't know if you want to call it glorified or not, but it's definitely going to be an immortal body, one that can't be destroyed, one that can't burn up, but it can feel and be aware of everything that's going on. So what's your choice tonight? What's your choice tonight? Do you, <laughs> do you really give your spirit, your soul, the kind of attention that it needs. Before I sat down this morning, I was trying to get you to understand. A lot of you need to stop being only concerned about feeding your face. <laughs> and start feeding your spirit. God's word is food for the soul. Beans and pork chops and all that. It's food for that part of you that's going to go back to the dust when this is over. And so since you're talking about eternity and you're talking about spirit, the part of us that God that's going to go back to God is our spirit. And if we haven't fed that spirit and matured that spirit and uh, 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 allowed that spirit to be led by God, then it can't be with God. That means you will have to hear those words depart from me. For I never knew you. Don't wait till you get to the gate. Because then it'll be too late. I'm done. Maybe this need, that should have been a class. I get more time in a class. If you're here tonight and you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins according to the gospel, then you need to know that you stand a guilty distance from God still. The Bible tells us that salvation is in Christ Jesus, Titus 2.10. How do you get in Christ where salvation is? Well, you get in Christ by being baptized into Christ. The Bible says that we are baptized into Christ. And if we've been baptized, we have put on Christ. So if you put it on, uh, and you, I hope this is, that, that's, that's not confusing. Uh, I am, I am in a suit. Yes. Everybody understand? But I had to do what? I had to put this suit on. So there's still some folk who claim they don't understand what being in Christ means. Uh, well, when the Bible says you have put on Christ when you're baptized, that's what it's saying. Because it's telling you that all spiritual blessings are where? In Christ. And you're told at the end that when you die, those who die in Christ, they're going to be the one that's going to be better off. And their works do follow them. So we need to be trying to help people get in Christ. Well, in order to do that, again, you have to hear God's word, preach, talk, understand what God's word is saying. Let it prick your heart. If it pricks your heart to the point the way it causes you to believe it, then the next step would be repentance. Why are you repenting? Because you have learned now that what you've been doing ain't been right. And you believe that to the point to where you're going to stop doing that because you have now learned better. That's repentance. Then you got to be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. That's important. I don't think God, Jesus put that in there just for something to say. If you deny me before me and I deny you before my father. If you don't confess me before me and I won't confess you before my father. So you have to make the confession that I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. And then you must be baptized. All of that brings you to Christ. Every one of those, when you read them in your Bible, 
it says unto. Now you need to get into. What puts you into Christ is when you get in the water, Bible says that's, that baptism is what puts you in Christ. That is a burial. Hello? And, the, and, and we are taught that we meet the blood of Christ in the water. So for those folk who've been going up there trying to look for blood in the water, again, you're missing the spiritual teaching. You got to trust that if God says the, you meet the blood of Christ in the water, you get in the water and don't be looking for the blood. That's their carnal thinking. Why? Because the Bible lets us know that when he died on the cross, when he got speared in the side, the Bible says out came blood and water. So we are taught in scripture that except you are baptized or except you are born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot be saved. So water is necessary. When you trust God enough to do what he says, get in the water. When you come up, here's what has happened. You've been promised by God that God has forgiven you for everything that you've ever done. What's the problem? You can't forget it. <laughs> Your friends can't forget it. And when, when really, those are the folk that you need to be cutting yourself loose from. But we can't do that. I can't give up my friends. <laughs> well, okay. Then you just got wet. Because until you can show, and God knows, God already knows what you think. Until you can show God that you trust him and you will obey him, your friends and whoever else is causing you to. <laughs> that's who you're serving. Then the Lord says, just now be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of righteousness. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to rent it. I'll give it to you if you do what I tell you to do. So that's where some folk claim that they're confused by, well, I thought salvation was free. Well, it is. Mm -hmm. But you got to understand that, too, from a spiritual perspective. It's free. But it don't mean you ain't got to do nothing. Just like you had to get in the water to have it available to you. Now you have to be faithful unto Christ, abide in him and do what he says until he calls you from labor to reward. That's the gospel truth. That's the gospel preaching. That's what can save people if they're willing to obey. If you're here and you're already a child of God, and again, as we said this morning, you know, you should know what some of those promises are. We already uh, uh, experiencing some of them, but I, I, I think we fail to make the discernment when the Bible, I think it's one of the reasons we have in Scripture where it lets us know God allows it to rain on the just and the unjust. So your next door neighbor gets on your nerve. They hate you to the point where it's got you hating them. But you got to understand, you know, when it rains, they get the benefit of the rain, too. Now, let me ask you this. What if God only allowed it to rain on the just? <laughs> In other words, only those who are righteous are going to get rain from God. What do you think? If that's the way it was, you know, do you think more people will come to Christ? Because they'll look over there, they see your house getting watered down. And, you, and they ask you, how come you getting watered and we not? And you ought not be ashamed. You ought to say, because I'm a child of God. They might say, well, I'm a child of God too. Well, evidently not. <laughs> not if the Bible says God only allows it to rain on the just. But see, he didn't say that. Why? Because those are those physical things. That everybody gets to enjoy. But there's some spiritual blessings that you're missing. Because you're not doing what God says for you to do. And we're begging you tonight. Put forth more of an effort to learn what that is. And do it. And watch how God bless your life. So if you're here and you find yourself in either category. You need to come forth. Do it right now while we stand and sing the Savior's invitation song. When 